across the UK, far and few between. So the 1008 service gets underway, part of a very limited number of trains operating today between Glasgow and London. Go back there on the concourse and the signboard tells a similar story across the central belt of Scotland. Are you affected by the rail strikes today? How's it affecting you? Um, to fair, I'm not affected. I've got mine. Mine's still coming uh, soon, so... You're, right. you're one of the lucky few. I'm one of the lucky few, yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't use the train at all. You I don't just, use the train? I drink my coffee here. Oh, you just come for the coffee? <laughs> what a wise man. Right. We're just asking if you've been affected by the rail strikes at all today. No. Uh, no? I drove 200 miles instead of getting a train. You drove 200 miles? <laughs> yeah. Was worth it? Oh, well, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. What? Well, hang on, sir. Hang on. What, what's going wrong? So I just tried to get on, but then it just got cancelled, so um, I have to go home. I won't be able to get to work today, so I just have to go back home and relax. From now into the new year, almost every day a strike day. The railways, perhaps airports soon. The NHS, Royal Mail, civil service. This afternoon, midwives in Wales, physiotherapists in England and Wales joined the list. RMT union members out in the cold in Coventry this morning. So too, pickets at London's Euston station with their boss. We don't want to be on strike. Our members are losing a lot of money from being on strike and we don't want to disrupt the Christmas programme. We don't want to upset people's uh, uh, social lives and their family lives. We want the railway to be running normally. There is time now to get round the table and negotiate a settlement. Black and red panel, please. Yeah, to take away. I see. Sit in, no worries. Anyone? Small business struck by the strike. The family-owned River Hill Coffee Bar. It's almost opposite the station front door here in Glasgow. A lot of our regular customers are office workers, of course, right in the city centre of Glasgow. So when the strikes are on, they kind of preempted us that they probably won't see us for the rest of the week because they're working from home. So it does affect us quite a bit with the train strikes at the minute. Big business is nighttime business. 33,000 employed in Glasgow's bars, clubs and restaurants, generating more than £2 billion a year. So we're up the famous steps into the Garage Nightclub on Socky Hall Street to meet the boss, Donald McLeod. The strike action is going to have a slow eroding effect on business. It's like a, a, a vortex of doom that's spiralling out of control, isn't it? I mean, what is it, 417,000 strike days since October? You must have the fundamental right to strike, otherwise you're a slave. But I think the RMT are taking this too far. George Square, minus six Celsius today, yet relations between the Scottish government and unions here are not quite the permafrost which seems to be setting in south of the border. Recent weeks have seen the long-running Scotrail dispute settled with the Edinburgh government. Take yesterday, for instance, even as the UK government was refusing to talk money with the main nurses' union, here in Scotland, two other NHS unions settled their dispute with the Scottish government, accepting an improved pay offer. But of course, more money going into the pockets of some workers in the NHS here in Scotland means less to go round elsewhere. The SNP paid a price of £1.6 billion slashed from spending. Even so, nurses could still strike in Scotland and teachers are still in deep dispute that I quite literally cannot put my hands on the money that it would cost for me to agree to a 10% pay deal for teachers. But of course... Yeah, so the NHS are a special case, but teachers are not? Well, local government workers in Scotland have accepted a pay deal which is fundamentally around about 5%. And many of those people are working in our schools, janitors, administration staff. And all we're saying to teachers is that there's... We, we, we've given that pay claim to local government workers and we're quite prepared to make a similar offer to, to teachers. Clearly, destinations for governments north and south of the border remain uncertain, subject to change or cancellation. Well, earlier I spoke to the RMT boss, Mick Lynch, and asked why his members had voted to reject the latest pay offer, given that members in Scotland voted to accept another deal. We have not had the same offer, and the deal in Scotland is pretty much unconditional. We've got a similar deal in, in Wales, we've got a similar deal on Mersey Rail and in the northeast of England, where the Department for Transport doesn't run those, those organisations. You're getting the same outcomes in health and education and public services 
wherever Westminster is not ruling the roost. So that's the problem. So They're you're saying Westminster is interfering and preventing you from getting that little bit extra money that would actually allow you to do a deal? Precisely, and they're putting conditions on the deal that we can never accept, such as driver-only operation. I've been on the airwaves about that for the last six or seven years, and we've been opposing it for 40 years, but they stuck it in the deal at the last minute so it couldn't be developed. But the fact that 67% of your members in Scotland voted for the deal, it shows you that the members really want a deal, doesn't it? Well, they got a better deal in Scotland. Our members voted in exactly the reverse proportion of our members that have just rejected it on network rail. So it shows that when a deal is there to be developed and it's on a reasonable basis, our members will accept it. But this week, on, on Monday, they've shown they don't want this deal and they've also voted nine to one in favour of carrying on with the strike action and the other industrial action. The danger of striking over Christmas, of weaponising Christmas, is that you lose the moral high ground with the British public. Well, we don't want to weaponise Christmas. We've left next week free of industrial action, strike action, and the, well, the strike. I mean, there's going to be a lot less service. There's going to be an overtime ban. The first ban. normal day of service is going to be the 9th of January. Exactly. It's because we have to bring this to a head. Our members have not had a pay deal in the train operating companies for up to three years. They'll be going into the fourth year next year and nothing acceptable on the table except to get rid of their jobs and sell out their conditions. I wonder whether it's just got too personal between you and Westminster. I've got nothing personal with Westminster. They are the elected government and they've got the right to govern. Only the electorate can remove them. What we've got is a government that won't allow a deal to be developed. If the railway executives that I deal with were allowed to put their deal across the table, we could develop that and I could put it to my members in a referendum. They have been stopped. The deal and the process was torpedoed on a Sunday afternoon at five o'clock when they said to me, they won't let me put the deal that we've put together together. But is this really honestly just about pay or is this about politics against the Westminster government? It's Are not, you trying to bring down the Westminster government? It's not about pay, it's about jobs, conditions and pay. I'm not trying to bring down the, the Westminster government. I've got no ability or desire to do that. That's up to the electorate. I'm a Democrat. Our members have voted for strike action and against the offer through very high turnouts, much higher than they get in the Westminster Parliament and much higher than we got in Brexit, strangely. Everyone accepts that result, but the government doesn't want to accept the voice of our members where they've rejected this offer. This is just going to carry on, isn't it? You're, you're hunkered down in your, in, your, you know, in your various trenches. You're not going to give up. They're not going to give up. You're not going to give up. This is for the foreseeable future. I'm not in a trench. I'm out there with my hand out saying, let's come to the table and do a deal. I'm not having a war with them. We've got a dispute. And you've got to remember, it's an industrial dispute with an industrial answer. So it needs a few bob of cash. It needs some goodwill on the conditions to, to address their agenda and our members. And it needs a job security guarantee. Would you like to see the Labour Party get more involved in this, the front bench? Well, Keir Starmer needs to sort out his values. He needs to decide whether he's on the side of the super rich and austerity, which is what the Tories have given us, or whether he's on the side of working people. At the moment, he's trying to triangulate, triangulate around this problem as if it was some kind of bad smell. Do you love the limelight? No. I'd love to get a deal and You're go very back comfortable to, in the limelight. Go back to my perch and go back to running my union and working on behalf of our members. I've been put here by circumstances, not by my own choice. And if we can get a you deal... You must enjoy this moment in the limelight, though. I don't enjoy the moment in the limelight. I'm not a person that has ever sought the limelight. I just want to get on with my job and carry on running our union and doing a good job for our members. Nick Lynch, thanks very much. Well, with unions, as we've just heard, accusing the government of standing in the way of negotiations, just how are ministers planning on ending the dispute? Earlier, I spoke to the Rail Minister, Hugh Merriman, and asked him if the government should be doing more. Well, the government has tabled and allowed the train operators and Network Rail to table generous offers. Um, one of the unions has accepted that yesterday. We have another union that tomorrow we expect to accept. Um, we would like the RMT to take that same approach and recognise that this is a good deal for their members and also a good deal for the railway because we have to balance um, the pay rises that uh, workers are asking for uh, with the taxpayer who's currently running the railway to the tune of billions. So it's finding that balance, uh, but we really want these rail strikes taken down. It will be really damaging for business, for passengers, for those seeking to get home at Christmas. Uh, and so that's what we'll continue to do. But something's not working, is it? Because the RMT have struck a deal in Scotland, a deal in Wales, a deal with Mersey Rail. Everywhere, in fact, the RMT boss, Mick Lynch, told us today, where Westminster isn't involved. You're the sticking point, he says, and the country is at a virtual standstill as a result. 
Well, that's not the case because uh, Transport for London under a Labour mayor has the same issues with the RMT. So it's not just this government. But deals are but being done in Scotland, aren't they? So deals are being done that don't deliver the reform that the railways need. For decades, the railways have relied on voluntary working. We haven't been able to operate a seven-day railway uh, unless we get the consent of workforce. So we want to do things differently. We want the railways to operate when passengers need them rather than on a voluntary basis. Uh, so these reforms not only make the railway more modern, uh, and more aligned to what the passenger needs, but they also fund the pay rises that the trade unions want to see. I mean, you say you want to do things differently, and that's certainly true. You have two major health unions in Scotland calling off strike action following ministerial intervention in Scotland. Here, you have the Royal College of Nurses Chief Executive leaving a meeting with the Health Secretary, expressing her deep disappointment at the belligerence of government. You're doing things differently, but which way do you think anyone going into hospital right now would prefer? Well, we have to look at the taxpayer as a whole. So if we were to look at funding a 19.2% pay rise, which is what's being asked for uh, by the nurses' union, then that would cost the NHS £10 billion. So we have to balance... But the nurses' the union needs say you're taxpayer. not even talking to them. Well, th those talks did take place. They took place yesterday. I think you're referring to talks that uh, didn't end with a resolution, but they were talks. And we are facilitating talks. We're being involved in those talks all the way across government. I am for the Department for Transport. But it's for the um, employers and the unions to negotiate those talks. The Prime Minister wants to characterise this as a battle between ordinary families and union barons. But isn't there a danger in that argument coming from the government? Because many people might regard it as a, a fight between, you know, for, by ordinary families who need to put food on the table. No, this isn't a fight with anyone. This is the government attempting to strike a balance by giving the public sector workers what we believe is a generous pay offer, but keeping it within an envelope that allows us both to control inflation and to stop public spending getting out of control. This is a Prime Minister, bear in mind, that when faced with the difficulties uh, of uh, COVID, delivered a furlough package. He's done the same on energy support. He will do the same when it comes to pay rises, but not at the expense of inflation, not at the expense of other taxpayers that have to fund uh, these pay rises when they're not getting the same level themselves. It's about a balanced approach and being fair to everyone. Are, are strikes just the inevitable price we pay for, as you say, not letting inflation run out of control? We reason with trade unions. Uh, we engage. We allow those negotiating to have a mandate to negotiate, but we need to send out a message that we will not do anything uh, which causes inflation to spiral further, because otherwise everyone will be poorer, and any inflation, uh, any pay rises that have been delivered will just get wiped out by higher inflation. Hugh Merriman, thanks very much for talking to us today. Thank you. Well, new figures from the ONS show that the number of days being lost to strikes has jumped to the highest level in more than a decade, with workers seeing their take-home pay squeezed by rampant inflation. Our economics reporter, Neil MacDonald, has been picking through the numbers. So, uh, what's the significance in terms of the increase in strike days here? Well, with households in the UK facing the largest fall in their disposable income since World War II, uh, perhaps we don't need to look that far for the reasons why there's suddenly been a big increase in the number of industrial disputes. So 417,000 days were lost in October. As you said, that's the highest number um, for more than a decade. It's quite interesting to see where those days are being lost. It may surprise you. So the number of uh, uh, strikes in the public sector was 48,000. The vast majority are actually oh, private really? sector oh, disputes, 369. Thousand, yes. Um, there's been some talk about this being a return to the 1970s. Um, well, not quite. What we've got here for you is the data, uh, for those who like historical data, going back to 1930 mm. of the number of days lost. We've highlighted uh, two spots in particular, the winter of discontent, late 1978, the miners' strike started in 1984. At that time, the number of uh, days being lost in a month was not 400,000, it was, it was millions. Now, of course, there are more disputes now starting involving the nurses and so mm. on. So the monthly number is likely to go up over the winter. So it's not quite the winter of discontent yet. But if this obviously impacts people's pay, what will happen to pay if this carries on? Well, if the pay squeeze is driving strikes, then get ready for more strikes, I'm afraid. Um, so today we learned that pay across the economy, so for all jobs, is going up by 6.1%. Again, there's a big split. So if you look at the private sector, Pay is rising faster, 6.9%. The public sector trailing a long way behind, 
2.7%. That gap between those two is one of the largest on record, except for during the pandemic mm. when there were some statistical anomalies. Um, and of course, whichever of those two groups you're in, inflation means that actually you're both seeing a decline in your living standards. Uh, today, we learned that um, after allowing for inflation, real pay is actually falling by nearly 4%. Again, that's one of the sharpest falls on record. And when is all this going to turn around? Well, of course, what would really help would be if inflation in the UK stops going up, starts falling. It's currently 11.1%. Tomorrow, we get the new set of inflation figures. They could prove significant. Of course, no guarantees, but there's a lot of speculation that inflation may have peaked, and we may start to see that tomorrow. Um, Slightly down in America, right, inflation? Uh, exactly. So the inflation figures today in the United States actually were the lowest rate for a year. If that was a straw in the wind, two very different economies, but if that was a straw in the wind, that would be very encouraging if we started to see the same thing here. That's, uh, let's hope that's right, that you're right. Now